in chapter number nine. I'm not going to read everything because it is a lot. This is a passage that is, we've been in Deuteronomy for 12 weeks. This is a passage that is actually retelling Exodus. It's retelling what Moses had went through with the people. And Deuteronomy chapter number nine says this, verse number seven. It says, uh, remember and never forget how angry you made the Lord your God out in the wilderness from the day you left Egypt until now. No, 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 my bad. Verse number, number six. You must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you are good. For you are not. You are a stubborn people. Actually, he says in King James, he says you are stiff-necked people. <clears throat> he says you are stiff-necked people. He says, you're a stiff-necked people. He says, you're a stubborn people. He says, you're stiff-necked. NIV says, you're stubborn. He says, remember and never forget how angry you made the Lord your God out in the wilderness. From the day you left Egypt until now, you have been constantly rebelling against him. Even at Mount Sinai, you made the Lord angry. He was ready to destroy you. This happened when I was on the mountain receiving the tablets of stone inscribed with the words of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and all the time I ate no food and drank no water. That's a biblical fast. Ate no food and drank no water. Didn't have no smoothies on the mountain. <laughs> Didn't get no Christmas salad on the mountain. The Lord gave me the two tablets on which God had written with his own finger all words he had spoken to you from the heart of the fire when you were assembled on the mountain. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord handed me two stone tablets inscribed with the words, the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, get up, go down immediately for the people you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly have they turned away from what I've commanded them to live by. They have melted gold and made an idol for themselves. The Lord also said to me, I have seen how stubborn, rebellious these people are. Leave me alone so I may destroy them. The God that loves everybody and cares for everybody says, leave me alone that I may destroy them and he raised their name from under heaven. That must have made God really mad. Then I will make a mighty nation of your descendants, a nation much larger and more powerful than you are. Verse 25. Verse 25. That is why I threw myself down before this Moses talking. First, the Lord goes through an account on all the ways they tried him. He goes through three different places in Exodus and Numbers on where they tried him. And he says, I should have killed them on that place. I should have killed them. When they started complaining about manna after I, I brought them with my mighty stretched arm, I should have killed them then. And then they started complaining about this and started complaining about this. And the Lord said, and then when I told them about the land, they came back and told me that we look like grasshoppers. I should have just got rid of them then, but I gave them grace. Almost a sense of being justified in the New Testament, being written in the Old Testament. I prayed to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, this is Moses praying. Do not destroy them. They are your own people. Y'all should have tore up the church right there. God, after all being stubborn, rebellious, Moses says, they're your own people. They're your special possession. Stubborn and all. Rebellious, complaining, never satisfied, never happy. God didn't do enough. He could have did more. He should have did more. They are still your special possession, whom you redeem from Egypt by your mighty power and your stretched strong hand. Please overlook the stubbornness and the awful sin of your people. And remember instead your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you destroy these people, the Egyptians will say, 
the Israelites died because the Lord wasn't able to bring them to the land he had promised to give them. Or they might say he destroyed them because he hated them and he deliberately took them into the wilderness to slaughter them. But they are your people and your special possession whom you brought out of Egypt by your great strength and powerful arm. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Really, I could sit down and not preach after that because we are not necessarily doing a church replacement of Israel, but we are clear that the New Testament church is what God died for. We are an Israelite type people, not saying that we are Israel, but God died for us. He originally came for Israel, but because his own received him not, he died for us all. And because he died for us all, we are his special people, his special possession. So I want to talk for a few moments. Yes, in the desert. So Moses is writing this narrative, this story, and he starts it off by saying this, they're stiff-necked people. Leading people is one of the most difficult tasks that you'll ever have to do. If you're going to lead any organization, you're going to lead people, you must have strong skin and know that people will not always be happy with every decision that you make. You end up losing to people when you end up doing like Aaron, trying to satisfy the people, and then you end up making an idol because you're trying to appease people who will never be appeased. Being a leader means that you must be strong. You just can't be charismatic. You also have to be a strong leader. If you're not a strong leader, you will move with the wind. The wind will blow you wheresoever you want to go. As a leader, you must lead. That means leading your house. We are not always taking a vote in our house on where we're going to eat. Somebody got to make the decision. We can't drive around all Sunday wondering where we're going to go eat. We're just going to go to Chipotle. We're going to go to Chili's. We're going to go to Cheesecake. Wherever we go, somebody needs to make a decision. Being a leader means you have to be strong. And some of us want to be liked and lead. Very few people have been liked and led. Most often, your brilliance as a leader is when you either are removed from the leadership or when you die. Black History Month. We did not celebrate Martin Luther King when he was alive. Most preachers historically did not appreciate him. But when he died, we saw the, we saw the effect of his work. So sometimes as a leader, you've got to learn delayed gratification. If you want gratification up front, you're not going to get it. You've got to learn the art of delayed gratification. It's like being a father. Most children are mama prone. They do not realize the value of daddy until they become old enough to realize, man, it was hard being a dad. It's delayed gratification. <laughs> my dad, I was going to the airport this week, and my dad insisted on taking me. And um, I was like, no, I'm good. I'm going to take an Uber. He says, no, I'll take you. It's 6 in the morning. And I said, all right, Dad, you can take me. But here's the only problem. Let me make sure they're not here. My mom and dad not here this morning. All right, good. So here's the only problem, Pastor Outing. We get out the car. It's 5 in the morning. He's at my house on time, as he always is. And because, you know, church, you know, to be early is to be on time. And to be on time is to be late. And to be late it's unacceptable. But, but anyway, the only problem with, with me going with him is that he would do this. Hey, can you drive? But this is exactly why I wanted to take an Uber, because I wouldn't have to drive. But then here's the other part that's the crazy part. He, he doesn't have an E-pass or a Sun Pass. He has change. And every toll booth we stop at, how, how much is it? $1.25. <laughs> at one point, I was like, listen, man, I got the money. Let me, no, 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 you don't pay. I pay. So I got to watch him count his quarters. There was one that was like $1.75. He like, hold on. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, oh, it fell. Hold on. Let me get another. But you don't appreciate your fathers until you get older. And then I left my wallet at the house, which had my license and everything, so I could not get on the plane. because I didn't. So I had to send my dad all the way back home 
to go through his quarters to go get my phone from my wife that has my license, my credit card, and everything, to come back. So I called him. I said, Pops, where you at on the road? He says, I'm, I'm passing Winter Garden. So I'm thinking, okay, it normally takes 30 minutes, but because you got all them quarters, it's going to take you about an hour to get here. So, but, but you don't realize the value of your father until you get older. But Moses, being a leader, means you have to have strong leadership skills. But here's what Moses tells the children of Israel, and here's what we need to know as well. Number one, God says, I didn't give you the land because of you. Your righteousness didn't get you in. There is a, there is a sensation amongst believers to want to believe that when other people sin, they deserve what they get. And the reason why you're getting the favor you get is because you're righteous. It, Paul says, listen, our righteousness to God is but filthy rags. The moment you think you're more righteous than the next person, God's like, all right, let me bring up your resume. Let me, let me bring up your DM. Let me bring up your chat line. Because our righteousness to God is absolutely nothing. It was not our righteousness that got us in. It was nothing but the blood. Jesus. Not a righteousness. Not a righteousness. Number two, drummer, bass player, keyboard player. <laughs> Number two is, your integrity didn't get you in. Your integrity didn't get you in. Lead singer. Your integrity didn't get you in. Your integrity didn't get you in. In. It's a long bathroom break. Your integrity didn't, I'm just saying, your integrity didn't get you in. Your integrity didn't get you in. Now, we live in a culture that wants to label everybody whatever. They want to label everybody a goat. They want to label everybody a power couple. They want to label everybody integrous. Integrity does not mean you don't cheat on your wife. Because some of you may not cheat on your wife, but you don't pay your taxes. You just cheat in different ways, right? That's, that's what you're saying. Integrity is if I tell you that I'm going to give you all your money, I'm going to give you all your money back. Integrity is if it costs $50, I'm not going to tell you it costs $100. So, so, so when we define integrity as, we define integrity as the hot button for us. Whatever is a hot button for us, that's integrity. But no, none of us have integrity. Because if we had full integrity, then we would be totally righteous. Now, you may be integral in some areas, but there are other areas that you lack integrity. I don't preach a quiet church. That's fine. But, but the reality is there are areas that you lack integrity, and God says, no, you didn't get in the land because of your integrity. You got in the land because I made a promise to your ancestors. You, you, you're stiff-necked people. Y'all were stubborn people. Every time I told you to go left, you won't go right. Every time I told you you're in danger, you'd give me a reason or a rationale on why this should happen and why that should happen. No, this doesn't make, he's very clear. Your ancestors I had a promise to, and I'm keeping my promise because if it was up to me, I would have killed all of y'all. Now, I know there's the blood of Jesus that covers us, but if you grew up in a historically saved household, raise your hand. Okay, most of you. So, okay, some of your parents were not saved. Okay, great. That's great. That's a good bet. So you might be a first-generation Christian. Your parents were Christians. But I want to know how many of us are being protected by the prayers of our parents? How many of us are being covered by the righteousness of our parents that said, you know what, Lord, I know they may go club. I know they may go drink at the other church. I know they may go smoke at the other church. But, but I pray you cover them, not because they are good, but because you got a mama and daddy that are trying to do the best they can to cover our seed. So he says, Moses, um, I need you to... To, to, to Moses' job as a leader and as a parental parent to them, a spiritual parental leader, was not just to lead them, but to also be their intercessor. He stood before God, and he stood before the people. He stood before God, and he stood before the people. So he would, he would be people enough to relate to them, 
but be with God enough to give them the standards of God, but to go to God and tell God, God, I know you know everything, but let me tell you what the people are dealing with. Let me be a mediator for the people. That is why pastors stand before God and they stand before the people. That is why you can't have a successful spiritual life with an online church. Because pastors get, oh, Moses was the first type of pastor if you study scripture. He was around the people to know what the people needed, to know what the people were dealing with, and he would go to God and say, God, I know you got your plans, but consider this. You're almighty. You're all-knowing. You're sovereign, and I am nothing, but I want to just say this on behalf of the people. You need somebody to stand in the gap for you, God. Now, Jesus died. We don't need a priest to be a mediator. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that a pastor stands in between you and God. God, he talks to God on behalf of the people. He's leading a people, so he carries the burdens of the people before God. And God hears him when they pray. Here's an interesting thing. God says to Moses, you know what, I'm, I may just use other nations to drive them out. So God could use the enemy who is being used by Satan, but sovereignly being used by God. Oh, that's so crazy. The enemy thinks they're using their authority because they're underneath the power of Satan. But in actuality, in God's sovereignty, they're underneath his authority, and he is using them to accomplish his will. Sometimes God will use an enemy to work your nerves to get out of you what he's been trying to get out of you by you not obeying him. God sometimes will say, if you won't listen to me, I'll let your enemies teach you what I was trying to tell you. If you won't listen to me, I will let your enemies teach you what I was trying to tell you. Some things you don't got to learn by experience. You could just learn by listening. But when you don't want to listen, I got to teach you. Some things you got to learn by listening. Some things you learn by being taught it in experience. So here's what he does. He says... Moses go up the mountain. Moses goes up for 40 days and 40 nights and prays. Now, I'm, I'm not into numerology a lot, but 40 is seemingly throughout scripture a number of testing. And for 40 days, he just sits before God. And he sits there with tablets. Tablet. You'll get that later. He sits there with, with tablets. Um, so he sits there with tablets. And God gives him in Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, that's what Deuteronomy means, it's the second giving because the first time we didn't get it right. So God gives them a tablet and tells them the Ten Commandments and this is what they need to obey him by. These are the laws by which they're going to have they're going to have fulfillment of their lives. If you live your life by these laws, you're going to have a fulfilled life, right? You live by these Ten Commandments, you're going to have a fulfilled life. So here's the interesting thing. Um, God gives them these inscriptions, but I want to just pause and ask you a question. Have you ever just sat before God until you heard something? Or do you get up before you hear something? Maybe your New Year's plans or goals, God was trying to tell you what he was trying to tell you, but you left when he started speaking. I would like to encourage you to sit before God and maybe sit there the first night and sit there for 30 minutes before God and just with your tablet ready and willing to write what God is saying to you. And then if God doesn't speak that day, come back the next day with your tablet and say, Lord, I'm not, if it takes me 40 days to hear from you, I'm going to hear what you're trying to say to me. And if you don't believe God speaks, that's on you. But I still believe God God speaks to us and he communicates his desire, his will, whatever he wants from us. God doesn't let accidents happen because there's no such thing as coincidence in scripture. It's all divine appointment. God sets things up on purpose before you even got there. He set it up so that you could be there and receive what he had for you. Right? So I want to challenge you. Maybe you should sit before God and like, yo, I ain't going to leave until God starts to speak to me. 
quit your job. What? I don't quit your job till you find another one unless it's the Lord. Now, if it's not the Lord, don't tell me that God told me to start a business and, and then now you're being foreclosed and now you're mad. Okay, you follow, follow. So now the Canaanite culture was known to have these three to seven inch images representing a golden calf. It represented fertility and strength. Let me tell you this. This is so interesting. It represented fertility and strength. These golden calves. Aaron, who's supposed to be the high priest, he like, yo, when's Moses come back? I don't know. Since Moses ain't come back, what y'all want to do? That's the worst thing. You cannot take the vote of the majority because they don't know what they want. That's what your kids don't know what they want. You feed them. If it was up to them, they'd want Skittles every single day. What you want for dinner? Give me Skittles. Give me some Sour Patch. Give me some chips. Give me some Pirate Booty. You know, this Pirate Booty is actually, it's, it's a real popcorn. Just because when my kids are like, Dad, I want some Pirate Booty. I'm like, y'all keep saying I'm going to whoop y'all because that's not appropriate. That is not appropriate. It's like, no, Dad, there's such the Pirate Booty. Okay. So anyway. What was I talking about? Okay, so, so the, the thing about it is this. God knows that if you're going to lead, you've just got to make decisions. You cannot take consensus. It does not mean you ignore people's, there's safety in the multitude of counsel. But if you're going to vie on the opinions of people, you're going to sway. And Aaron says, well, what y'all want to do? They say, well, we want to build a golden calf. So Aaron's like, all right, let's do it. Let's go ahead and build it. And they were building these for fertility and strength. Here's the thing. Only God can give you strength. You can't get it in no other power. Only God can cause you to produce. You can go to school and still not be able to produce. It is only God that can take your degree and make it produce for you. It is only God that can take your education and make it grow for you. Because I know a lot of people with degrees that aren't producing. I know a lot of people with muscles that don't have strength. Only God can give you the ability to produce and have strength. Oh, only God can give you the ability to produce and have strength. Only God can do that. But here's the thing. When we can't wait on God, we find solutions for ourselves. How many of you have God's second best because you didn't wait for his best? Now, I'm not, now it is possible to be married to God's second best. Because you couldn't wait on God. So you're like, well, you know, they're not bad. If I tilt my head to the side, if I lean back, they are, right. you know, they are, they, you know, they ain't, they ain't exactly what I'm about, but a, little, a few drinks, they look good. You know, you know, all this type of stuff, communion. And so all these type of things, and God's like, no, let me tell you, if you do not wait on me and you try to manufacture your own blessing and you try to manufacture your own strength you're going to have to keep it alive you're going to have to keep that door open but if you trust me and learn how to wait on me that when I don't move you say Lord I'm going to wait until you move because I am in a season in my life where it will cost me too much to make a premature decision Anyway, um, here, here it is. Moses, <laughs> Moses, only one PDSJ. Moses reminds, Moses reminds God, the word Hebrew, what is the word pada? He reminds God. I just want to let you know, God, you can kill them. And you can whip them. And you can destroy them and start brand new because they're so stiff-necked. They don't want change. They want the promised land, but they don't want the change that's required to get to the promised land. Listen, you can kill them. They are stubborn, but they're yours. They're your special possession. As mad as you get at them, as much as you want to whoop them, they're still yours. Woo, that's a part to worship God. 
Y'all that be in church, that be so, oh, you know, that's not my personality. I'm not the type of person to get crunk in church, you know, a little lit and all that type of stuff. But when you think about that, God, God cared for me even when I was rebellious, even when I wasn't doing what he wanted. God looked and had an intercessor that stood in between me and my sins. And what Moses did for them, Jesus does for us every day. When God says, I want to be God, Jesus said, hey, God, you need to remember I died for them. I shed my blood for them. Give them another opportunity to worship you. They ain't prayed in three days, and you bless them with a job, bless them with the biggest thing. They didn't work. God, give them a break because I shed my blood. What Moses did in the Old Testament, Jesus does in the New Testament. He stands in the stead. So I, I have a reason. Be throughout historically, historically, we have been a people that are not appreciative to the great things God does. They, when, when Kobe passed away, one of the things that they said that was the most profound, it said some of, sometimes the most underrated blessing is coming home. That we don't thank God for the little things because we want to thank God for the big things. And because we don't thank God for the little things, we start complaining. So what I wrote in my notes is, can you do a seven-day no complaining starting this Sunday? Don't complain about the weather. Oh, I'm tired of this weather. It's too hot in Florida. I want to wear my boots. And then when you get your boots, it's too cold in Florida. I want to wear my T-shirt. And then when you wear your T-shirt, this humidity ain't doing good with my hair. And all this type of stuff. I'm so tired of this job. But but you didn't have a job before. I don't like this car, but you were catching the bus the other day. I don't like these kids, but you couldn't have kids a while ago. So can you, I'm, I'm not, I'm by nature, I'm not a complainer. I can't stand people who complain. I would rather just internalize and complain. I am not a complainer. So going on a seven day, no complaining is not a problem. I, I will find a solution and complain. But some of us are stiff necked. We complain about everything. Is the sun is out to you. This sun is too hot right now. It's just, well, no one told you to go stand in front of the sun. And God is saying, oh, everything I do for you, I never get a thank you. It's always is this problem it's always another problem it's always this it's all that is there a time where you could just remember how good I've been to you and remember I should have killed you a long time ago I should have been finished with you a long time you have no integrity you are rebellious you are stiff-necked but yet I still keep feeding you over and over and over and over and over again. He's not a God of a second chance. He's a God of another chance because we ran out that second chance a long time ago. Oh. So here's the thing. I got to go with this. Being favored by God makes you entitled. just one of the things children of Israel felt like oh, what it is you you picked us you know what I'm saying you picked us and God's like I didn't even pick you because you were worthy I picked you because you were small Deuteronomy 7 I didn't even pick you guys because you were cute I picked you because nobody wanted you and you should have in your mind that nobody wanted you. It's like the guy on the basketball court that never get, you, you kind of know how it feels, to be on a basketball court and never get picked up. And then all of a sudden, somebody does you a favor and they say, Wilkins, I'm going to put you on my team. And then you get on the team and now you want to shoot. You want to dribble. You should be, and you mad because you lost. You wouldn't have been playing if I didn't pick you. You would have been sitting on the sidelines. But I picked you out of my goodness. You weren't even dressed right. You weren't even good enough. But because I had mercy on you. That is a true story. <laughs> so here it is. And I'm closing with this. All the music stuff. What happened? <laughs> Superpowers. But here, here, here's this. Is. So God, when God favors you, you can feel entitled. 
And that's why he has to continually say, don't forget, because you can feel entitled. You can feel entitled. You can feel entitled. So, so here's what I want to close with is this. We need to be like Moses, an intercessor to stand in between. We got to stand in between. I, I want to know how many people in your life, and hopefully it will, it will raise you up to be a Moses. Like maybe you could be a small group leader and be a Moses in that setting to a small group today at 5 p.m. They're training you. But here's the thing. How many friends do we have that will go to God on our behalf? Now, no, no, no. Look at our Israelite behavior. We like to think about everybody else. But the real question is, am I one? It was so easy to be like, man, I don't have nobody. But the real question is, are you one? Can God find you laying out, praying for Nate, praying for Mike, praying for Barbara? Are you the type of friend that's going to lay on your face when someone calls you and says, I'm sick, and you don't just do the proverbial Facebook post, I'm praying for you. Can God trust you to be a person that when they come, they say, well, I saw my girl. She was on her face before God, and I don't know what she was crying about. I don't know what she was praying about, but I heard her mentioning your name. Are you that type of person, or are you waiting for your generational parents to continue to be it for you? No, I don't need you to pray for me. Some of y'all just don't. Y'all don't pray at all. Y'all just post, we're praying for you. Oh, we're praying for the Bryant family. How long you pray? Because it's politically correct. Most of the people who say they're praying have never prayed. They just post it. And that's as much effort. But God is looking for people that will sit on their face and say, it ain't about me. I'm going to pray on the behalf of somebody else. When we start having Moses like that, we can start shaking cities. We can start having revival start happening. Because revival doesn't happen because you got a great praise team. It doesn't happen because you got just great preaching. Revival happens in people. It doesn't happen around the tabernacle. It happens in people. Can your children count on you to pray for them? In the world you're sending them to and they can't find you on your knees for them? They're in a dark situation. And you may not be the best prayer. You may not be the most intercessory prayer in person. But you better learn how to turn it up in this season. Because your children are depending on you. And they don't want to know who killed ghosts. They want to know, are you praying for me? I don't want to know about jail. I want to know, are you praying for me? Your friends need it. They're losing loved ones and losing their mind. But all you're doing is tweeting. You're so busy trying to get money, so busy trying to get the bag, that you're not even spiritual. If you're in the hospital, are you a person that you would call on to pray for yourself? I'm not even saying you got to be deep. I'm just saying you got to be consistent with it. You ain't got to be perfect. Just be consistent with it. Here, here's where I'm closing. Again, my fear for your generation and mine, because I'm a part of it, I was told is that God is a tool that helps me get promotion. I'm trusting God because he's going to open doors. I'm trusting God because he's going to bless me. I'm trusting God because he's going to help me in my career. What if he don't do any of that? God is almost like a, a Ouija board that we use to get what we want. Oh, I, I know it's going to happen because I, I believe in God. As if that is the go-to card to get whatever I want from God. And the reason why we feel that way is because we're entitled. God owes us nothing. 
Hear me. He owes you and I nothing. And if he does something for us, it's but by the grace of God. He don't owe you no new church kingdom. He don't owe you no new building. He don't owe you no new favor. He's already been good enough. He's already done more than enough. He's God. Right, he has us pray. Father, I've said what you asked me to say. In the time you've allotted me to give, help us to give you a yes like Moses because a yes to you means a no to many things we could have said yes to. So Lord, we give you our yes with our heart, with our soul. We say yes to you. Yes in the desert. Yes when there's no one around. Even in the bottom of the desert when they're making their own idols, we still say yes. So Lord, help me to have more consciousness that it wasn't my integrity it wasn't my righteousness. It was your covenant with my ancestors. Help me to not be like the children of Israel feeling entitled to a God who has been generous by grace and by mercy. So help me to focus on that and appreciate that and grow in that. It's in the matchless in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. If you receive that, would you clap your hands today? Seven days, no complaining. Seven days, no complaining.